So, why are we here? Today is a celebration of you. It is a celebration of all women who have played an important role in your life and the history of New Zealand, pioneers of the past who have paved the way for our future. Our theme for today's event is Each for Equal, Our Stories. And when I think about role models and I think about pioneers paving the way, I think about my mother. Uh, so my mother was, uh, so she didn't drive. Uh, she didn't know how to drive and she refused to jump in a car and learn how to drive. Uh, but she had this ability to be able to surround herself with people who were able to take her to where she needed to go. Um, I have to add, it does help to have the gift of the gab, and she was very good at that. Uh, she built a network of women who had a common interest and a will to get things done. Uh, she was known as, um, to many children as the auntie who used to take eggs, milk and bread uh, to their families. And, um, and she used to utilise her network of women to be able to get her around the neighbourhood to be able to go deliver basic essentials that she knew um, parents with children would, it would come in handy. Uh, and so today you will hear about um, women, uh, you'll hear from inspiring women who will talk about the women who inspired them. Uh, so we look forward to um, their stories. So let's talk about our panel. Today you will hear three stories from three women who are passionate about the areas that they are involved in. There will be moments that may resonate with what you hear and how you will feel. So sit back and let me introduce you to our panel. Okay. So first we have Ayla Huita. Ayla is a youth innovator for the Southern Initiative at Auckland Council, where her focus is on youth and tech and innovation. Ayla is currently working on projects with the Ministry of Education, Tech Designers and Manurewa Youth. She has worked with youth across South Auckland to generate creative ideas about council initiatives and incentivise their time. Ayla is also a co-design facilitator of Bano Workshops. So please put your hands together and welcome Ayla to the stage. Uh, can I just add too that Ayla is accompanied and supported by her twin boys today. Um, so the next person we want to uh, welcome and uh, to the stage is uh, Atero Pofari Ellis. Atero is also a youth innovator for the Southern Initiative at Auckland Council, where her focus is on youth, develop youth employment, working on the Māori and Pacific Trades training program to pathway Fano into training whilst linking them into progressive, sustainable pathways of employment in the construction, infrastructure and allied trades industries. So if we can welcome Atero to the stage also. Um, Atero is also accompanied by her daughter today too. Niece, niece. Oh, niece, niece, sorry sweetheart. <laughs> okay, last but not least, uh, let me welcome Minnie Baraguala. Minnie is the Chief Possibility Officer and founder of the newly established Global Centre of Possibility at AUT. Ten years ago, she, along with her incredible team and board, established Be Accessible, a social change agency committed to the creation of 100% accessible New Zealand, particularly for the 25% of people living with an access need. In 2019, Minnie led the transformation of Be Accessible into the Be Lab and established what was to become the Centre of Possibility at AUT. The Centre of Possibility, with its unique emphasis on possibility design and innovation as the key to future transformation, is the next chapter in that pioneering story. Minnie's work and study as an access innovator and a social entrepreneur extends over 25 years and has included many diverse roles. Minnie's sitting there going, thinking, oh, no, not yet. <laughs> and finally, over the last five years, Minnie has been awarded the New Zealand Order of Merit, the Sir Peter Blake Leadership Award, the Westpac Woman of Influence Diversity Award, the 2019 Zonta Centenary Women's Award, 
and was placed as a top 10 finalist for the Kiwi Bank New Zealander of the Year. Welcome to the stage, Minnie. Um, before we get started uh, in the, uh, the panel talking to you more about their stories, uh, at the end of this uh, particular session, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So we will have some Romy mics uh, that will be going around. Uh, we will have Megan and James and some others who will help with that. So while you're listening to these stories, I'd like to plant the seed for you to start thinking about uh, there may be moments where you're like, oh, I'd like to know a little bit more about this, or um, I wonder what they did when they were 10 years old. Uh, so we just, just want to stir some um, th uh, thinking um, and just to prepare you that there, is, there will be an opportunity to ask questions uh, after the session. Uh, just, um, our, um, if you want, there are probably lots of seats over here. If, it, if it's not a good view over there or even on the edges, uh, more than welcome for you to just move to wherever it's comfortable for you. Okay, are we ready? Perfect. Okay, Tess, yep. Okay, we're on. Uh, so this is a real opportunity for us to get to know a little bit. Um, I did read out what our panellists do, but it's a good opportunity for them to tell us a little bit more about who they are. So uh, maybe we'll start with Ayla, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay. <clears throat> Kia ora te whānau, ngā mihi nui kia kai te katoa. Uh, ko ai au, he uri ahau nō no wai katoa tainui, ko taupiri te maunga, ko wai katoa te awa, ko tainui te waka, ko ngāti tahi ngā te hapu, ko ngā hau e whā te marae. Uh, ko poke koe te tiranga waiwai, engari e noho ana ui a manu rewa. Uh, ko Selina, Olive, Hoita, me Mary Hemopo Oku Whaia, Whaia Tua Toru. Um, ko Graham Tokupapa, ko Kapireira me Makaira aku tamaiti. <laughs> ko Ayla Hoitaho. Kia ora te whanau, um, ngā mihi. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Ayla, I'm from Waikato Tainui. My maunga is Taupiri, my awa is Waikato, my waka is Tainui. Um, I'm born and raised in South Auckland, born in Pukekoe, Spent my childhood in Pukekoe, now I live in Manurewa. Spent most of my life in Puki and Manurewa, Māngere. Um, and I'm just here to share my story and hopefully connect to other young wahine in the workplace or through my story growing up. Um, yeah, so thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora, Ayla. Atarau. Kia ora nā, kia ora koutou katoa, nā mihi nui, kia koutou uh, i te taho tōku māma, he ureau nō nai tūhoi, ko mauna pōhatu te mauna, ko rani tau ki te awa, ko, hikurani, uh, ko mā tātua te waka, ko rani tau ki te awa, ko waio hau te marae, ko tāmaki ku rani te tīpuna whare, uh, i te taho tōku pāpa, he ureau nō rakahana, so, he kuki a rani a hau. Um, ko Atarau Pau Farealas tōku unua. Kia ora whānau, my name is Atarau Pau Farealas. Um, Mum is Māori, so she, is, she hails from the deep uh, Uruera forest. So, she's not Ngai Tūhoi, I'm Ngai Tūhoi descent. Dad is Cook Island and he comes from Rakahana. Um, I'm 26 years of age, born and raised in South Auckland, mainly Ōtara. Ōtara is my home and... Um, I am not a mother of any children, but I do play a part in terms of um, raising my nieces and nephew, and I'm very grateful to have my niece here today um, to support us in our kaupapa, but um, yeah, I'm really excited, a little bit nervous, but um, we'll try and loosen up throughout the, um, throughout the conversation, and I'm really looking forward to be here, uh, looking forward to just sharing with you some of my journey, and um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully to connect with some of our young women here that are starting off their careers or um, just trying to find their way in a space that is often not open to us. So, kia ora. Kia ora atarau. Okay, Minnie, enlighten us. Oh, oh. <laughs> no pressure then. Okay. <laughs> tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Minnie. Um, I'm not a youth leader. Um, I was suddenly felt, oh, God, 25 years. Anyway, um, <laughs> not of life, that is, of doing my job. <laughs> Um, I'm, um, I was born in, uh, in the Manawatu, Palmerston North, 
And um, my mother still lives in, in Wanganui, and actually I was so delighted. I hadn't been there for quite some time, but I was there over the weekend. And I just it just reminded me that home is home. <laughs> and it was so beautiful to go back and reconnect um, with, with my, my place of birth, actually. I, I love that part of, of Aotearoa. And I'm also really excited to be here and a little bit nervous and so delighted to be up here with these lovely, lovely women here. I just can't wait to hear their stories. I find my own story a little bit dull, but hopefully others don't. <laughs> well, you know, when it's your own story, it's just your life. <laughs> But really delighted to be here, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Uh, so I shared a little bit about uh, who's the role model for me and who, ins who has inspired me. And we were lucky for Jacinda Ardern, just, um, I think yesterday she posted up around who are the women that have inspired her. So the first question um, for you and is, uh, this is International Women's Day, and our intent is to share a story of inspiring women. So can you tell us about a woman who has inspired you on your journey and what's one lesson she taught you? So maybe, Atoro, we'll start with you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't have just the one woman in my <laughs> life that has inspired me. I grew up in a very strong network of um, very strong women. And um, my mother, um, Matewai Pofare, and my grandmother, Ramarihi Atoro Pofare, who I am um, named after, were very pivotal figures in nurturing that in the mana wahine with inside myself. Um, I always, my going back to my grandmother when we were younger, I always used to see her working so hard. And I used to live up back home in Waioho, so it's the it's the centre of the universe that my father always tells me. And um, it's a little place between Murupara and Te Teko, and like literally, if you drove past it, blinked, you'll miss it. Like, but it was home for me, um, and I spent a lot of my I guess childhood years growing up on the marae, growing up around our papakaina, and I always used to see my queer, my queer always going up to the marae early, like break of dawn in the morning, always up there. And then um, she wouldn't come home until like almost 10, 11 o'clock midnight. And I always used to wonder to myself like, wow, what are you doing up there? Like I was up there and I didn't see anything happening, but um, <laughs> that was just, just a childlike mind of mine. And I always used to wonder why my queer was so giving. And every time, like no, like, no doubts about it, like, she would be giving everything she had. The little bit of that, of what she had, she would always give. And um, I remember one time asking myself, like, why is my nan, like, reaching into our cupboards, giving kai to these whanau? She doesn't even know them. But that literally is the essence of who she was. And her whanau were just, didn't matter whether we were related biologically or we just met for the first time, she literally gave her all. And um, I think one lesson I took from her was her manakitana. Her manakitana to take care of her community, her hapu, her iwi, and just, just to un her unfailing love for any one person. So that was very pivotal for me. And um, going on to my mother, um, Matewai Pofare, um, she had the hard task of bringing myself and my 13 sub, um, well, I'm a part of a 13 sibling little Brady Bunch here, but <laughs> I, I really disclaimer, my mother did not give birth to all 13 of us. Um, prior to um, my brother and I, she, um, they both had um, relationships, but we meshed well. We just had a blended family. So I just always grew up knowing that they were my brothers and sisters. So my mum, she had the hard task of bringing us up in Auckland. And that was huge. That was totally different from what I was used to seeing. Like, you know, buildings, all this infrastructure that was just based around this big city that I didn't know much about. And um, I really respected my mother because... For me, my, the perspective I had was that she was loving, she was nurturing. Every time we got home, there was like a nice kai on the table, hot meal for us to eat. But on the outside, others would have perceived that as, oh, she's sitting on the benefit, she's doing nothing all day with her life. But for me, that was so important because I, I am the youngest of all my siblings. So um, my mother worked her ass off pretty much, to get us to where we were and to support us where she could. And not saying that my dad didn't, so I, I just know that this is a woman's day, so we're <laughs> celebrating the women's in our life. But my, my father was also pivotal in that space as well. But um, yeah, my, my grandmother and my mother were huge parts of that. And, I, and going into my teenage years, I had one more, um, 
I guess, influential woman in my life. And we know we all have that one teacher, right, that we all just yes. remember, that we all just know that once we go through life, we're always going to remember this person. And um, my, I have that person, and um, her name was Mary Ann Malpaz, and she was my favorite teacher. She was the teacher at the time in my life that believed in me when no one else didn't. I was 15 years old. I was going off track. I had already told my friends, yeah, I'm done. I'm done with school. I'm not doing it again. I'm over it. And um, she, she actually came into my, um, came into, I, I actually got into her history class. And I remember one day she was just sitting down with us and she was teaching us about Waitani, the Treaty of Waitani, and just teaching us about who we were. And I, I looked at her and she was a small Pākehā woman. And just to think that she was Pākehā was just like, oh, no, no, I don't resonate. We don't relate. But that was the beauty of it is that even though she didn't look like me, she didn't sound like me, she believed in me anyway. And that's all I needed in that moment. And from that day on, it was just like every day, she just kept telling me, you can do this. You can be what, anything you wanna be. And I think for me, it was just like, okay. I started to take in that, it's that self-belief stuff, right? And um, when I spoke to her, um, I remember one time in class, she, she turned around to all of us, and I think we were, I graduated in 2011, and I remember her turning to the class and going, do you want white old men ruling your lives? And I think, <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, okay. No, but taken back from this one, but, um, and she just sat there really seriously looking at us, and I just kind of looked at, it, looked at her, looked at my friends, and I go, do we answer that? Was this a trick question? <laughs> and um, she just turned around, she goes, well, votes. And then just went back to just drawing on the whiteboard again. And I think in that moment, I was just like, wow, you are mana wahine. You are Pākehā, but you are mana wahine. And I felt, and then um, after that, like after we graduated and everything, I still kept touch with her. Um, actually, my older brothers and sisters on my dad's side, who are all of like 50 plus years old, mm. that was her, their teacher as well. And they loved her, and they always used to say, hey, are you in Malpass's class? And I was like, nah, not yet, not yet. And then it's um, funny to say, because my niece that's with me here today is um, Malpass is actually her tutor teacher. <laughs> and um, and it, was, it was just like, it's this intergenerational thing, right? And she was able just to capture the attention of Ranatahi, who just didn't think that education was for them. And even though I believe growing up, my, my parents instilled in me that, you know, got to learn, you know, that my dad was very, I guess he was just so, so fixed in the Pākehā way that he was like, the English is the only way. So I never learned my real, or my Cook Island real growing up because he mainly said that Cook Island's not going to get you anywhere. You need to learn Pākehā and that's it. So um, I'm very grateful today that I'm surrounded around um, a very strong network of women and Malpaz being that for me. And um, I also had an older cousin in my family who was, um, her name was Tanya Pofare. And she used to be that one that we used to go into our family houses and there'll be this big photo portrait. And it's always her standing <laughs> up in her gown, graduating from the University of Auckland. And I think for me and our family, it was like, I wanna be like her. I wanna wear a flash gown as well. And um, I want all my family to talk about me too, but it was just, it was just so <laughs> great to be exposed to a huge um, array of mana wahine, wahine toa. And um, yeah, so I couldn't just really put it on the one. So I'm gonna, um, yeah. <laughs> so I had, a, yeah, I had a very great network of um, strong women in my life. Kia ora. Kia ora, atere. thank you. <laughs> I think for any mother or auntie out there that's got struggling teenage girls, we probably all need Ms. Malpez's number uh, to call for some assistance. Thank you. Um, Minnie, do you want to tell us uh, who have been the women in your life yeah. that have really inspired you? Yeah, look, um, similarly, I obviously none of us can obviously follow, follow the rules because I found it really hard to just make it one person as well. <laughs> but um, perhaps not surprisingly, I also want to start with my mother. And my mother um, is Rosemary Baragwanath. And, um, oh, she's just extraordinary. <laughs> she's not easy, but she's extraordinary. And these two things often go together, I've, I've, I've realised. Um, um, but I don't think I've ever met another person with a more um, innately fierce sense of social justice. It's just like woven through her DNA. She just cannot go past... A, anything in life if she feels it's unfair or unjust. And that means she will speak up in any situation, 
brothers' weddings, you know, <laughs> governor general presentations. Um, <laughs> She hasn't sort of learnt, you know, the sense of occasion part. But anyway, um, but what I grew up with was a sort of raw, powerful energy of um, speaking her truth. And, um, and it sort of culminated, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in Palmerston North, which is a, you know, a fairly conservative <laughs> town in many ways, and um, very rugby-oriented in terms of sports and all of that in the 80s. And uh, she was one of the... Um, early people there to get involved with protesting against the Springbok tour. And for any of us who were around then, you know, that was an extraordinary time in our history and defining in so many ways. And at the time, I didn't really understand. I was only 10 or something, and I didn't understand why she was doing it. And I remember going to school and being sort of teased about it, you know. But coming home one day and finding out she'd been arrested and, you know, this is an upstanding wife of the local vet kind of thing, you know. <laughs> And, um, and sort of thinking, hey, that's kind of amazing. And, but sort of not knowing whether to be proud or embarrassed, you know, at the time. And then all those years later, when Nelson Mandela um, was finally released from, you know, prison, and he, he mentioned the incredible support of the people of Aotearoa, you know, and how that, that really gave him strength. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, he was my mother, one woman, on the other side of the world, in this tiny town here in, in Aotearoa, standing up for what she believed in, and um, how it actually changed, helped, helped to change the world and the course of history. And I think that's, as I've got older, I've just come to value that more and more. And it, you don't win popularity contests for this kind of stuff. And in fact, I think often the real trailblazers, and you look at people like Kate Shepard, I mean, they were... They were shunned at the time. It wasn't the trendy cool thing to do. It wasn't a popularity contest, as I said. But they were people who just knew their truth and they knew something was wrong and they knew it had to change. And somehow they put their lives on the line often to, to really stand up for what they believed in. And so that's the kind of, I guess, imprinting I've had, whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> Um, and I, I mean, I am in, it's so grateful for it now and, um, um, and just treasure that, actually. And so her influence, and then so it's sort of extended from that sort of macro level, I guess, of a political kind of stance. But then, you know, um, right through to the fact that, um, so I was diagnosed at 15 with a rare sight condition, which means I'm blind in the center of both my eyes. And so I couldn't read my books at school and I couldn't see the blackboard and all of those things, which are fairly important when you're at school, apparently. And, um, and I, but for some reason, anyway, it made sense for me to go to university um, instead of staying on at school. It's a long story, we won't go into that now. But, um, <laughs> but um, for some reason, I decided to study English literature. And I don't know why, because it turns out there's a lot of reading in English literature. And when you can't read, so yeah, I was obviously had joined the dots completely and but my mother who you know solo mum bringing up the four of us on her own and she would come home at night after nursing and doing all that stuff um, and she would narrate my novels onto audio cassette and send them to me I was I went down to Victoria University and I mean I just think back and I think oh my gosh I, I don't think I could have got through my degree without that incredibly practical tangible support and I guess it meant so much more than just that it was her again her her deep belief in in me and wanting me to have every opportunity to to succeed and um, I came across one of these audio cassettes a few years ago and it was just the most emotional and kind of extraordinary thing and Mum wasn't very good at editing bits out, so she'd spill her tea and it'd be like, oh, my God, I've just spilled the tea. And I'm like, don't think that was in the novel, but, you know. <laughs> or my brother would walk into the room or whatever. So it's kind of like an audio archive of that time. But anyway, um, but yeah, and um, oh, just quickly, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a long time. But the other person who's been extraordinary is Dame Tariana Toria, who, when we had the initial idea for setting up Be Accessible, um, I had the opportunity to meet with her when she was in Parliament and she just got what we were about and she enabled us to get the funding and the resourcing we needed to set up the Social Change Initiative um, back in 2011 and it's just, 
I mean, again, the power to back you in whatever stage in your life and to be backed by another extraordinary woman, um, as she is extraordinary, uh, literally life-changing, for not just for me, but for the people that we've been able to, to work with over the years. So that's, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Minnie. <laughs> Um, I think uh, what, what we can definitely take uh, from what we've heard from Ataro and Minnie is that uh, when we believe in each other, uh, when women believe in each other, we can achieve anything. So let's hear from you, Ayla, and tell us who's inspired you, who are the women in your life. Okay. Um, I have to share a funny story first. <laughs> so it's quite daunting seeing yourself up on a poster like that. And um, what brought me down to earth is my two sons looked at the posters last week and um, they go, Mom, you have two yellow teeth and you're holding a tissue in your hand. And that made me feel so much more comfortable. But <laughs> it just brought me back down. So I, have to, I had to say that. Um, so I'm the same. I don't have one manawahine in my life. I've had a few on my journey, but I start with my two queer who raised me, Mummy Olive and Mummy Sarah. So I've got three mums. I said that in my papa. My biological mum didn't raise me. My two nanas raised me, and they were grand aunties. And um, I'm going to share my, my story and my journey because that's how I can uh, really, in, really highlight how these women have influenced my life. So my two nans... Um, they took me in from the age of two. So I was taken off my mum before I was one by Oranga Tamariki. My mum had seven kids, and every child she had, Oranga Tamariki, took all of them. It was like after the first two, so I'm the second, they would be waiting at hospital with a police officer to remove the child from my mum. So that's the first, I think, the first trauma that I experienced in my upbringing. And now I see it on my mum today. Um, so my two nanas, they devoted their life to saving children. They have raised over 25 children in their life. They turned 80 this year. And I never understood why, because I felt like my life, my childhood was really hard and cruel and unfair. And I never empathized with them because I just thought it was unfair how we were treated. But now, when I hear about the intergenerational trauma, and there's just been a book released called No Māori Allowed, and it's, it's around what happened between the 1930s to the 1960s, which was my nana's generation, and how they were treated. And I'm going to share some of that. So my two nans, um, in their era, there was a lot of racial segregation in Pukekohe. So Māori weren't allowed to walk on one side of the street. If you went to the picture theatre, you weren't allowed upstairs, where, was, where the best view of watching the movies was. You had to be in a segregated area downstairs. Um, no, no one would cut a Māori's hair in Pukekohe. There was one barber who would cut a Māori's hair, and they had a special chair for Māori. And they had to sanitise and clean that chair after a Māori's hair was cut because people were scared of catching a disease. No one would hire a Māori in Pukekohe. So they couldn't get jobs and they couldn't get housing. So my nans who are turning 80 this year, still work on the market gardens. So back in their era, as young kids, they were forced to work on the market gardens in Pukekohe and live in slum-like conditions. And now we are hearing the stories coming out through this book about hundreds of children that died because of the conditions they lived in. So that's what my nanas went through in their upbringing. And, and through that time, a lot of kids were taken and removed from their parents through Oranga, oh, Child, Youth and Family, now Oranga Tamariki. So that's, that's the story of my two nans. And so my story is they, they took me in and kept me from the system. They also took my brother, but I have other siblings who weren't, I believe, saved from the system. And so I have another brother right now who's in jail and a little brother who's still in the system. And I don't know where he is, just that he was in Whakatane last year and he's got all kinds of issues. So my upbringing was, as a child, really hard. And I feel like I was a bubbly child, but I was also damaged. And I went through a lot of things that a child shouldn't go through. Um, but that didn't stop me from reaching for the, for the stars. I had, <laughs> I had goals, and I had one teacher at um, Puki North School as well. And she is the one, well, one of them who said to me, education is the only way out. 
She just kept saying that, and she planted that seed, you're going to go to university? You're going to go to university? And she talked about it so much that we started to believe it. So when I was 12 years old, I set that goal. I said, when I get older, I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to come back to Puki, and I'm going to show all these young kids that no matter what you go through, if you're treated like shit, called shit, all of that, you can still make it up and you, beca- you can become something. So I, I, I just wanted to be a positive role model for the kids because I felt like I understood the struggle. And, and then I said I was going to travel the whole world. So those were my goals when I was 12. Um, and then I went on to high school and I was so lucky. I got into Auckland Girls Grammar School and it was, wasn't because of my nans. So my nans didn't see the value... My two nans who raised me did not see the value in education because they did not go to school. They were angry at the system that they were brought up in. So why would they put me in a Pākehā education system? They didn't see the value in that. They were strapped for speaking Māori. So they never encouraged me to go to school. It was my other nana, who is the same woman who gave me a job at Ōtara Flea Market, which is where I worked all of my life until I was 17 years old. It was her, another woman, who said to me, education is the only way out. So I, I saw, like, I think there were three girls from Puki who went to Auckland Girls, and they became my role models. And they were the ones who held themselves tall, walked with pride, and they dressed nicely, and they acknowledged people. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, they're so cool. I want to be like them. And they went to Auckland Girls. So... I worked really hard to get into the school. I didn't get it in my first year, so I got it into my second year. And so I went to eggs, and I, 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 st- <laughs> okay, my first day of school, Deeney Rose, my friend, she's in the audience. I don't know if you remember this. Where's Deeney? <laughs> <laughs> my first day of school, I started um, with piercings on my face, crip bracelets up my arm, and shorts under my skirt. And it took me ages to come out of that because in Pukki you had to be hard to survive and you had to be a little gangster. So, so I, was a, I was a little cripster. I started at this all-women's school and I, I thought the only way I'm going to get through this is to be hard. But it was the opposite to that. And women were, oh, these young women I, I learned in the school were like women. And they spoke to you, they called you by your name and they didn't wear shorts under their skirt, and they looked pretty, and they did their hair, and I thought, oh, man, this is so weird. But after about two years, I adapted. It took me a whole year to realize that there's something beautiful in being a woman and taking ownership of that. But I was so used to, you had to be hard, you had to be a tomboy, um, it took me a while to get out of that. And also the shock of coming into the city. The same thing, like being around so much buildings, because I'm from a little town in Puki. We grew up on the market gardens. I grew up clipping onions with my nans, and now I'm in this big city in this big school full of all these pretty girls. And they wear skirts, and now I wear dresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so through eggs, I got to see, oh my gosh, there's like amazing opportunities. And I really made the most of them, and I started to do really well in school. And I even got a few awards, and I was really sporty. Basketball kept me in school in my first year. I almost dropped out so many times because I couldn't understand the education. I used to sit in the toilet because it was so bloody hard. And I hated it. I hated going to school. I used to miss nearly every single Monday of school. Um, But I got through. And and basketball, I wanted to play in the A-team. I just said to myself... If I just stay one more year, I'll make the basketball team, then I can play basketball, then I can drop out. And that's, that's, basketball kind of saved me at that hard time. So I stayed, I made the basketball team, and then I started to make friends, and then I started to like it, and then I was okay. And then I stayed in school, and I made it all the way to year 13. <laughs> Whereas all my siblings, all my cousins, the cycle is you drop out by the age of 14, 15. That's the cycle. So I was already starting to um, <clears throat> change that path. Um, however, when I got to year 13, I was pulled back into that cycle. That's what it feels like to me. And I've, I uh, met, met a boy, my first boyfriend, and six months later I was hapu. So I was pregnant. And I was pregnant with twins, two kids, not just one. <laughs> so um, it was like 
even when I was starting to do well and I was starting to get away from those cycles around, I was raised by two single mothers, my mother was in jail all of my high school years, there was a lot of gang, crime, you know, negative cycles. I was away from that, but I still felt like I got pulled back in and I became a single mother at the age of 17. So I think by then I was starting to feel like, fuck, this is just too hard. No matter what I, sorry, excuse my swear <laughs> word. No, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, I'm, I'm destined to just carry on those cycles. Like my mom, what my mom went through. Um, that's what it felt like. Uh, but I didn't let that happen to, my, to, to me and my boys, and I think my boys became my biggest driver. And I knew if I, if I don't get out of this, they're going to be the same as my little nephews and my brothers. So I had, to, I, had to, I had to change my path. So um, when the boys were two, I went to university, AUT, and I did my degree. And I thought, holy, I can't believe I finished my degree. And then I got a scholarship to do my honours, post-grad. And then I did my honours, and I got first-class honours in communications. And I, <laughs> thank you. And then I thought, far out, I, I, I can't actually do this. I am not a part of those cycles, and it's not my nan's fault, it's not my mum's fault, it's about us changing what we can today, creating a new cycle for our younger ones. So after that, I, um, I got my, I call it my dream job. So I work for the Southern Initiative, and... Our job is to create positive change for Māori and Pacifica, mostly in South Auckland, because those are the whānau who are most affected by the, the systems that are not built to help our people thrive. So in my job, I work with rangatahi, I work in different schools, I, I create a space where they have a voice through the program that I was look, um, working on. Um, I'm, I'm also working on different projects around student retention, um, uh, tech innovation. So I feel like through all of that, I'm actually in a place that I dreamed about, which was to, to go back and support our kids, show them another way. Um, and, and, and I believe I can do that because they see themselves in me. They don't actually when they see me because they think I'm dressed nice and I look pretty. <laughs> But actually, when I talk, then they know that they can relate to me. So they must hear it in my voice. <laughs> my friends used to say I just sound hoary. But I don't sound hoary. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I have this dream job. And it feels like it's not a job. I go to, I go to work every day. And I'm empowered. And I'm... I'm reminded through my kids and through what I see, especially when I go home, that I have to do this. I have to just keep grinding. You have to, you have to. Because if you don't, who's going who's gonna to show them? How can they believe they can get out unless there's someone else they can see? They need positive role models. So that's um, a, a big part of my life in the last few years. And so I'll go back to those goals that I made when I was 12, traveling the world, going back to Pukki and being a positive role model. This banner is in, in the Pukekoi Library, and I've had a few of my nieces and nephews like send me pictures doing their hand signs and stuff, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to stay on my path of being a positive light for other rangatahi. And traveling the world, I set a goal to travel to 30 countries by the time I was 30. I've just turned 30, and I've been to 35 countries. Yep, and I, I even, so I'm a solo mum, and I even took my two boys, and one of them, he dreamed about going to Machu Picchu, so we went to Machu Picchu two months ago, and I'm not rich, I just save really hard, I work two other jobs, so I have three jobs, and I just save, 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 um, and that just shows, like, you can do anything if you put your mind to it, um, and, th and then one of the biggest things that has empowered me, um, oh, one of the, sorry, well, not the biggest thing, the other manawahine in my life is Gail Surgina. She's, she's our, yeah. she, she is like our boss, but she doesn't act like she's a boss. 
She just, she acts like she's the same as all of us in TSI. And she created this role for me and supported me and believed in me when I doubted myself. And she has just been amazing. And she's another Pākehā wahine. She's, you know, I really embrace the women who have surrounded me and helped me. And a lot of them have not been um, Māori. So, yeah, I just needed to add to what you said about your teacher. Um, so I really want to acknowledge, yeah. So Gail, my nana Mali at, through the Ōtara flea market telling me to stay in school, and my two nanas who were really hard on us, but they kept us from a system, and they saved us. And now I hear the stories of what they went through and the racial segregation. I empathize with them. Um, let's see. I think, yeah. Oh, I was going to share one more thing, and it was just that um, in the last three years, I was so blessed uh, to be able to, through the Housing Foundation, uh, buy our own whare, so me and the boys. Three years ago, we were able to somehow save enough for a deposit and get our own house. So we live in Waimahia, and Housing Foundation have um, created this scheme to support single mums or whanau who are not earning enough, but they, are, they show a record of, um, you know, making income and they're saving and they're trying really hard to get over that line. So that's one of our other achievements in the last few years. And I have another friend here, Jim, who's, Jim. Um, who's, who's, who's uh, created a program to support whanau into housing as well. So thank you. Uh, so if you need uh, support or Fano needs support in housing, just come and see Jim <laughs> up front here. Uh, thank you, ladies, for sharing your stories about inspiring women. And there were some very common themes between the three of you around uh, women who believe uh, in you uh, and also a woman who uh, travel the journey with you. Uh, and what I love, too, is the reflective moments throughout your life and how you've been able to reflect on that um, past and how it's empowered you to uh, move forward. And it just sounds like goals, uh, setting goals uh, and striving to achieve them is what motivates us to keep going. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, so International Women's Day theme is Each for Equal. And we've just added our touch on, which is our stories, and we're hearing that today. So, uh, Minnie, we'll start with you. <laughs> If the idea about each for equal, um, that an, an equal world is an enabled world, can you tell us about what this means to you? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a big topic, isn't it? <laughs> um, I've just got to say, though, also, Gail Surgener. Is Gail here today? Because Gail was absolutely pivotal in my life as well. So I think she's a common thread, possibly. Just had to say that. Uh, <laughs> Each for equal. So, um, because for me, I guess my growing up with my sight impairment and being a woman, the two things are very intertwined, actually. I can't really, um, it's hard for me to pull those two things apart. And um, so when I think about the theme of each for equal, it is, I, I, I look at it, pardon the pun, from the perspective of a, of a blind woman's perspective on that. And so... When I think about um, that theme of, uh, you know, each for equal and creating an enabled world, what would that be like? You know, what, how, would we, how would that be different? And I guess it's the, um, the fact that women with disability or access needs are amongst the most um, disadvantaged in any society and are often the most invisible, actually, in, in any society throughout the world, it doesn't really matter where you go, <laughs> and um, often face amongst the most um, intense hardship, whether it is for education, housing, employment, and there's lots of multipliers that can be, you know, built into that. And so I, I guess when I think about where we have yet to, to reach, I think, um, I think we need to do more. I think we need to do more for women living with access needs. 25% um, of our population has some kind of a disability or impairment. That's not a small group. 
30% of millennials identify, so probably 30% of young women identify as having some sort of a disability or an access need. And so how are we ensuring that our pathways uh, to employment, to, to education, uh, to, to leadership, um, to, to, to ensuring that their voices and perspectives are heard, we need to be much more intentional about that, I think. Um, so I would want to be looking for a world where the, the discrimination is, is no longer there. Um, and the discrimination is there. <laughs> and I think it's unconscious, but I, I think it should be conscious. I don't think we can use the excuse of unconscious bias anymore. Once we know something, it's no longer unconscious. <laughs> and if we know that young women with disability or access needs aren't getting the same opportunities, the, the next step is then what are we going to do about it? And, you know, we talk about... Um, one of the most powerful statements I ever heard um, was actually from a, a woman I know, and she heard it from a, and someone else, so I can't remember the actual source of this, so don't quote it as me, because it's not my quote, unfortunately. And it's, it's about the, in the disability area, the soft bigotry of low expectations. And, you know, if I sort of hear one more person say, we're going to employ one person, and it's an organisation that employs thousands of people, we're going to take on one person with an access need or a disability this year, I'm like, really? It's 2020, dudes. Sorry. You know, um, but really, I mean, when I was 19, 20, I just, you know, struggled through my first degree. Um, and I remember a friend's father saying to me, Minnie, what, what are you going to do? I imagine you're going to work in a call centre. Now, that would have been fine if that's what I wanted to do. But why did he make that assumption? Well, it's because I was blind female. <laughs> and that's all that he could think of that a blind woman could, could do. Um, we need to get a lot more imaginative. And so for me, an enabled world, an equal world is about possibility. And that's probably why I've moved into the role that I've now moved into. And um, we created this kind of concept of the spectrum that there's a disability worldview, there's an accessibility worldview, and there's a possibility worldview. And too much of the world is captured in this disability worldview. And what I mean by that is it's about deficit. It's when we default to what's wrong with people. We, we, um, the pathology of, of the bad stats, you know, that kind of thing, where we only hear about what people can't do. Um, and I'm not interested in that anymore. <laughs> um, and when we set up B, we wanted to shift the narrative to, to accessibility. It's about all of us are diverse and our functionality changes throughout our lifetime. And an equal world needs to acknowledge that, actually. It's not just for the perfectly formed, able-bodied human being, of which there are very few, actually, <laughs> when it comes down to it, you know. Um, and when, um, a few years ago, then I thought, well, how do we, what's this worldview that is really going to challenge us to step into a different future and, you know, redefine what's possible? And I thought, what if we called that the possibility worldview? And that's about actually coming from a, an accessibility leadership perspective, truly co-designing with people with access needs, not doing it to them or for them, um, but actually how do we involve people with access needs in the design of employment processes, of our law, of our policies, of our technology, of our communities? Um, that's when I'll know we'll have an equal world, is when we are very intentionally investing in and designing and getting away from these sort of minimal um, ideas that we take one person a year when we're employing people because we're too scared. Um, we need to be bolder. And I, I think women probably need to be the ones to really take up this. Well, men too, actually. Actually, everyone needs to take it up, so actually. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just half the people. But there's something about, actually, we need to be a lot bolder, I think, and a lot more courageous. Um, and really back ourselves, no matter what shape or form we arrive in this, on this planet in. Um, you know, so when I think back about the fact that I was asked, you know, is that my career aspiration? And I think today, you know, I was lucky enough to have the backing of those incredible women along the way, which, and, and men actually, I have to mention John Allen, who's an amazing man, who, who's been the chair of our board. And I think, you know, when I stepped out of the role of B-Lab last year, um, you know, we were employing, we'd, we'd been going for 10 years, we employed about 15 people, a lot of women actually, 
um, a lot of half my team have disability or access needs, and then and we'd invested in leadership, employment, right across the country. And I think of the value that that will have created in our economy. And if I'd listened to that one person who just wanted to limit me because of their limited mind, I think that's the problem. And I think that's the the challenge for each for equal is we we mustn't limit each other. We have to see the possibility in one another and then do everything in our power to support and unleash that. So so it's a bit of a rant. <laughs> but it is all about I think this thing to me is an embodiment of what's possible and I think all the stories today are so about what's possible actually. You know, this is this is the embodiment of possibility to, in my mind. So and limit Don't know if that answered the question actually. Yeah, it, it, it did absolutely beautifully. Yeah, no, that was perfect. I think uh, the the world of possibility and limiting the limitation um, was a strong message that came through what you just shared. Yeah. Ayla, do you want to add to that? My view of an enable world is uh, is an equal world. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I wanted to share some. Oh, what, I, what I've seen in the workplace and how we can contribute so much around innovation, retention as well for women in the workplace. Um, and just, I think women in the workplace provide positive role models for other young wahine, so they have someone to look up to. Um, but, yeah, I think it's about closing the gap. So there's three key stats I want to share. Um, one is only 3% of professionals in the tech space are wahine, like women, and only 2% of the top 50 businesses run in New Zealand are women. So that makes me think, I don't think any of them would be Māori, but I'm, don't quote me on that. And I was just um, reading yesterday, someone sent me something from the New Zealand Herald that if, if we had more uh, businesses embrace gender equality, it would lead to economic growth, and that economic growth would be 881 million. So that was like from Deloitte research. That was in the New Zealand Herald. That makes me think, it's not just good for women, it's good for business, it's good for everyone. Um, yeah. Kia ora, Atero. What does it mean to you? An um, equal world is an enabled world. Yeah, I guess from a personal perspective, I really struggled to answer that question because I, like I had mentioned before, I grew up in a very strong um, whanau where, women's value, where, where women were valued. So um, our koro, our queer understood and um, really embraced and nurtured our, our wahine. So um, it wasn't until I got into university, actually, I started to learn about gender inequality. And I was like, oh, wow. And I was having a bit of a discussion with my niece this morning on the car ride here. And we were talking about um, the difference, like, in terms of how I, how we were grown, uh, how we grew up, in terms of our our koro, our, my father, he was always saying like, you know, you can be whatever you want to be. You can be a lawyer. You can be a prime minister. But then it wasn't until I got out of that space that I realised that there was this real stigma on wahine. And um, when I got into the workplace, I really started to understand a bit more, especially in the social context that we work in. And I think for myself, I'm um, just going off what Minnie said. As um, I think a lot of us as women put a limitation on ourselves, and it's around how do we break those uh, um, those barriers that have been created. And um, but doing it on a as individuals, but connecting into a network of strong wahine. And um, for me, I'm so like, I, I think back as from an indigenous um, woman's perspective and knowing that my queer who, who looked after and um, looked after her hapu, her whanau, her wider community, she was able to feed her, her family. And for that, a, a lot of us would be like, oh, that's the typical domestic sphere. But that wasn't for us as Māori, as Māori women, we knew that um, our koro and, and um, our uncles couldn't go out and do the mahi that they did without our wahine um, keeping the home fires burning. And so I grew up with a very different perspective. So when I went through high school, I was like, I can do whatever you, you're doing. And that was my attitude. It was like, I didn't think of it as me being a woman. So when I, um, out of um, my family, my siblings, we like, there's like, I think six of us on my mum's side. So there's three boys, three girls. So it was quite equal in that sense. And um, my brothers never stopped me from doing what I wanted to do. And I always was like, 
I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it to high school, and I'm going to make it through. And I did. I, I became the first um, out of my siblings to finish high school, which was massive for us because I was the youngest. And then um, I was also the first to go into university and finish a university degree in um, sociology. And so I had a real huge support network, and I think when I saw that, I was like, this is what an equal world looks like for me is that when us as wahine can go into any room and any space and not have uh, inclusive diversity policy there for us. Because that's telling us that, well, in order for us to get into those leadership roles, we need to have a type of paper that signifies that. And for me, that's not what I want for my niece. And, um, and I have three um, children that I help support um, and look after. And um, one of them is a boy, and his name is Wurumu. And he grows up around us as women. And, that, and we always try and, and, I guess, open his um, worldview around that it's not just his job as the man to go and do this, but you're going to come and dry the dishes as well. You're gonna wear, my niece is going to get out there and mow the lawns as well. And it's around how can we create that diversity within our homes first before we try and go out there into the world and change a world where it's already been pre, um, pre-created. And um, I think for me it's been really important trying to instill those values into my, our kids because um, they're the next generation and knowledge is so power. And if we try and understand that if we just come together and acknowledge our own, our own superpowers as women, then um, we can make that change. And just like, um, yeah, going back to what Minnie said, it's totally the limitations, not just on um, everyone else, but ourselves as well as women. And I think sometimes when I look back to some of the young women that I've had the privilege of um, encountering, they're like, oh, do you think I should get that? Do you think I should apply for that job? Do you think I'll be good at it? But I always, my, my response is try it. You know, you're going to fail. If you fail, then get back up because it's the resilience that keeps us going. It's not us as women that keeps us going. It's what we go through is what we grow through. So, um, yeah, so that's probably my, um, I didn't want to go too, uh, too into it, but as from a personal level, it's really just like trying to be an example for a lot of the women around us and um, especially from our communities that don't often see themselves in spaces like this. And, um, and I think, yeah, just being able to be your authentic self whilst bringing your cultural value to the table. Because at the end of the day, what sets us aside from everybody else is gonna be those home values. Not the fact that I got a bachelor's degree or you got a commerce degree. That's not gonna set us aside from somebody else that, that's gonna come in there with all intentions and be unapologetically themselves. So yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, so Atero, thank you. While we've got you all warmed up, we're, we're going to wrap up this um, session with uh, one more question, and then we'll pass the time out to uh, any questions from the audience. So uh, start thinking about what you want to know from our panel. Uh, so Atero, uh, what advice would you give to young women starting their careers? Um, I think, yeah, just be fierce. Be fierce <laughs> in who you are and know who you are. And whether that is being Māori and going back to the marae or being PI and going back to your homeland or just being you and knowing who you are, I think the main thing I always try and share with my niece is that um, don't be anyone else. Because at the end of the day, we, we're, we're, we're surrounded by, by so many poses, I guess. That's the word I'm going to use. But um, social media plays a big part in that. And for especially our wahine, ranatahi. So I think for me is be unapologetically yourself and be real as, as you can be. Some people are going to like it and some people aren't. But you're not here for that. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to stray a world where we're trying to, us being young, being brown, being, um, being, I guess, opinionated is something that's gonna very, like, gonna be something that we can nurture and really start to mold into, I guess, our career pathways as um, young women. But yeah, just love yourself. Self-care is so huge, and especially when you get into a space where the spaces that we walk into, and we often take a lot of our work life home, and our life, I guess, our personal life to work. And it's how do we really take care of ourselves and go, well, today I'm not going to be superwoman. I'm just going to be lazy. And, like, you know, and it's okay to be that. Like, and I think my main thing is just really saying that it's okay to not be okay. 
And a lot of our women don't really take that on. It's, there's so many pressures around us to be a certain type of woman that in order to be successful, we've got to do these things. We've got to look this way. But sometimes, like, you know, Ayla and I could come in and look like this, and then we could just go in and wear some track pants and some sneakers down to the dairy, like everyone else. And um, I think it's just really harnessing that and saying that, you know, today, yeah, that just, just be yourself and love who you are because no one else is going to love you the way that you love yourself. And um, yeah, it's just a little bit of advice, but you'll see as, um, yeah, I guess we all have our own journeys and we'll be all able to kind of like look, yeah, work that the way we do. So yeah, kia ora. <laughs> kia ora. Okay, Ayla, tell us, what, would you, what advice would you give to a young woman starting their career? Um, I think what's really important is to follow your passion. So how do you know what your purpose in life is? I think you follow what you what makes you happy, what brings you joy, and then that you, you figure out how you use that to support other people. Um, there's also some key things that I've learnt through my job, and I'll just list a few of them. One is no assumptions. Do not make assumptions ever, and Gail always says this to me. So asking questions is good. Um, another one is Begin with the end in mind. So everything you start, remember what your goal is or, or what your vision is, and every decision you make will be guided by that vision. Um, what else is important is to be yourself, like Ataro said. Um, no one is better at being you than you. Be your authentic self. Love yourself. Embrace yourself. Let everyone see you for who you are. Just, yeah, I really, that's a really key one. Um, damn, I had a few others. Uh, <laughs> oh, have a plan. Have a plan or a vision. Know what you want. If you don't know what you want, just put down what you think you kind of want. At least, at least you'll have something to work towards. And I always say that to my boys as well. Like, you might, want, you might not know what you want to be, but just choose something for now, and you, can, you have something to work towards. And if it changes, that's all right. Um, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> I, I thought she was going to add and also make sure you have jokes um, and be funny because before we started this, she said, oh, can we keep it funny and have jokes because it'll ease the nervousness, yeah. right? Yeah, so be funny too. Okay. Minnie, uh, round us off with what advice would you give to young women starting their careers? Well, I just love what you both said, actually. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, must take notes. Um, <laughs> well, um, so there were probably two things, I guess, and probably echoing very much what's been said already, but I think around really standing up for what you believe in, and even if it's really tough, um, I think it's just, it's so important to be able to feel that sort of sense of authenticity and square with yourself when you look in the mirror. There's something about your own integrity, um, your own values, um, because you're right, and at the end of the day, you're sort of the person you've got to come back to. You know? <laughs> um, and um, the other thing I was thinking about is learning to really listen. Um, to like deeply, deeply pay attention to the world around us, you, oneself, um, what's going on to really listen to the, the people that love you. Because I think um, often if we are feeling a bit lost, often it's the voices of those who have more experience or something who really love you that um, I've, I've found have kept me on track when I felt a bit wobbly. And so really, even if you don't believe it fully, but really hear what, what's being said and the tone of it. And then I think finally, and I think this has taken me a really long time <laughs> to do, uh, is to really listen to myself now and to really pay attention to what I'm feeling deep inside of my, you know, being. Um, even if my brain hasn't caught up with what that is yet, it's something about actually pay attention because I think certainly after a certain amount of time, um, I think there's so much wisdom that we hold in our, in our beings, you know. <laughs> and um, so that's sort of listening at those levels, uh, I think is just so important. And take giving ourselves the time to really listen and, and process um, and not having to react speedily. Because I think there's so much pressure to be fast in the world at the moment. Just go, look, I just need a minute. <laughs> take a minute. 
create the space and then move from that place, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's not easy being up here, but I think all three of them have done a wonderful job in uh, sharing their stories, being very vulnerable at times, and uh, being able to impart some of the experiences that have shaped uh, who they've become today. So we're very grateful to have you here. Uh, and uh, now it's over to you in the audience. And so uh, we're going to pass out a couple of mics, and we'll have one up here. And um, the, the floor is definitely now open for some questions. I can see some hands going up uh, just over there at the... We thought that there might be a moment of si awkward silence, but it looks like we're not going to get that awkward silence, which is fantastic. <laughs> First question right there. Kia ora and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings be upon you all over here. My, uh, I, just like to, I, I just want to say, Ella, your story really touched my heart. And uh, it was really heartwarming to hear all these stories from the panel. My question today is um, for a woman who is sort of in her mid of her career, like me, and wants to move into the leadership space, what advice would you give a person like me who wants to move into the leadership space? Thank you. Is it skinny in particular? Or? Um. I'll just say the two first things that came to my mind, and the first one was relationships. How important it is to nurture important relationships. I think no one can say it doesn't relate to their job. Like, the work today is all about relationships. So find those um, champions around you and really um, make the most of them and keep them close and and. Don't be afraid to open up to them and share what your what your goals are, what your ambitions are, because those are the ones who will support you. And then the other thing that came to my head was um, governance. So I feel like, I don't know why, but it's so important for um, our women to be sitting, more women to be sitting on governance boards. And it might be, oh, I don't know, it might be something else for you, but um, find something where you can have more of an influence and work your way towards that. And it could be not a government, it could be something else, but yeah, relationships, influence, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Kia ora. Have a little crack at that. Did you, did you want to say anything? No, okay. Um, so a couple of thoughts there. I think one would be to let the people around you know. So if there are managers, I'm not sure where you, um, where you're from or where you sit, but in the organisation. But I think contacting those around you or above you is it, it probably is quite a hierarchical situation um, to have that conversation and to look at what's possible. Because I think sometimes people don't realise <laughs> that um, someone might be really wanting to extend themselves. So I think that can be quite good. Um, and what I did, <laughs> just, and this sounds a little bit facetious, so it's only half facetious, was that when I felt that I wasn't getting the opportunities, I just left and set up my own organisation and made myself the CEO. <laughs> if I'd waited, I would have been waiting a very long time. So, you know, <laughs> don't wait for permission, you know, could be waiting forever. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, my little lovely swim floor. I'm Maria. I um, just want to say thank you so much for the cordial this morning. Um, my question was, uh, often on days like today for International Women's Day, um, people tend to forget um, the intersectionality and what makes us women is really different to, I guess, what um, like a woman at the centre is usually what. I, was, I just wanted to know from your perspective as Māori and also many for you as a uh, disabled person and uh, person who needs has access needs, how can we as able-bodied people or our Pākehā be better allies to those in our workspace and really bring that sisterhood to um, our workplace environment where we're all really different? Um, yeah, that was my... Um, Kia ora, sis. That was a great question. Um, no, um, just going back on what Ayla said around relationships, it's huge. And um, I think my experience has been is that I've been 
exposed to so many great women in my space, whether they're Māori, PI, Pākehā. Um, I've been mentored by a lot of great women. And I think when we built that relationship of being mentored in that space, like my, I think when I first started my career at the Southern Initiative, my first mentor was Frances Haig. And she was a Pākehā woman who, um, who always said to me, she goes, Atero, um, I will always acknowledge that I live the privileged life. And I will never shy away from that, but I also empathize and acknowledge that your life and your upbringing was not so privileged. And it was just having those one-on-one -on -one, um, one -on -one conversations that really was able to get me into a zone where I was like, oh, okay, it's not just us and them. And it was like, we're women, we're trying to get through this together. And um, I think once I started doing that, I started connecting with other like-minded women within my space. And they were really, we started really honing in on um, trying to, I guess, they, they really nurtured us too. A lot of it was like, because we're, we're in a, um, in, at the Southern Initiative, a lot of women um, are there. So we were able to like learn off them and they're like so fierce. And when they get up and they, they could get up and um, have lunch with us and then go into a boardroom and kill it. <laughs> like, you know, and that's exactly what it was for me. So it was being exposed to role models like that where I was like, oh, wow. And then going up and be, having that personable relationship. So for me, that, um, that would be the advice is just building those relationships and building on those relationships. It doesn't have to just stay at work. It could also kind of come out and go, hey, do you want to catch up and have coffee in the morning? And, you know, and some of it, a lot of it is that interpersonal stuff that starts to weave through. And they're able to go, well, from my experience... I can start to unpack that potential for you where you couldn't really see it happening yourself. So, um, yeah, that's, that will be my one um, advice is really is um, that relationships um, building is huge. Great question. Got another one down here, uh, just in the middle. Hi, uh, my name's Tina, and I just wanted to ask... Um, so for those that come from maybe male dominant industries or environments, how would you balance the feminine masculine energy of those environments and maybe educate or hold space for those that aren't quite there? Because I find that for women, they become quite disconnected when they're trying to be quite masculine in the environment as well. How would you kind of open space and allow people to be feminine and woman and nurturing? Um, <clears throat> I didn't grow up around any males. <laughs> so I'm going to share, I'm going to kind of flip it and um, share how I have tried to provide space for my two sons to have male figures in their life. Um, I think... It comes back to those relationships, those mentors, your connections. So for me, I'm sorry I can't answer it directly. I'm just going to share what came to my mind. But I've accepted that for my sons, I can't be a male role model for them. And at a time in their life, they need it the most. They're coming into their teenage life. So I went out seeking mentors for them and finding, trying to figure out who were pivotal uh, men, or who, who were strong men in my life. But... Um, it's not always easy to do that. So I think it was around creating space where those connections could happen. So for my sons, I've, I've, I've been so lucky to get them into a school, Dilworth College, where they are surrounded by positive male figures. And then I come back to the how do you nurture woman. I think it's like woman to woman, empower each other. Like you are what you say, you are what you think, you are what you do. So be it yourself. Um, speak positively of other women, um, help other women. Like, we have to support each other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's all I um, I think just one thing that I would add to that is because um, I work in um, Māori Pacific trades training, so the construction and infrastructure industry are predominantly male, right? And I remember one hui that I went to with Francis Haig, my mentor and also colleague, we went down to a board meeting at Ministry for Women and um, it was holding, uh, I guess, a governance hui with all of the big um, employers but the CEO at the CEO level, and they were all male. And um, we all sat on this table and then they were just going on about like, you know, just moaning about like all the stuff that, that doesn't even matter. But they were just going on about it like, you know, um, we actually, they, they were the ones that created the space. Because they were going, we actually want to employ more wahine because they're better at operating the machinery than men are. 
And it was actually them creating the space. So for, for a second there, when I first walked into that meeting, I was like, oh gosh, I get, better get the guns ready because I'm going to get attacked. But it wasn't really that. And it was like they actually understood the whole importance of that. Like they even said to, um, um, to our chairperson, Francis Haig, at that time, they go, we need more women in, the, um, in our spaces. How do we get that? Well, first of all, my, my, my question to them was, do you create enough space for those women to be in there? And they were like, oh, well, probably not. Yeah, probably only having one male toilet on site isn't going to be the solution to your um, problem there. So they were just starting. It was just little things like that. It was like because it's very behavioral and it's a culture that they've created within themselves that they needed to be checked on. And, and I wasn't afraid to because Francis Haig allowed and opened up that space for me to go, all right, well, this is what it is. And, um, yeah, so I've, I, yeah, going back, it's just the connections, but it's also that male can, males can also create that space for us. And, all we, and sometimes if they can't, we need to create it ourselves. And whether that is, like, creates friction in the room, it doesn't matter. Because tension is good is what I've heard and learned. So, <laughs> yes, that, that will be my answer to that question. And I just quickly, um, I just realised in that moment that I don't employ many men, so... <laughs> Not only did I just avoid the other thing by setting up my own organisation, I just ended up employing mostly women. And yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I do think there's something about, I think if you are in an area where it's, it's tricky, I think it's finding those allies, male or female, that it's really important because it can be really hard going. Whatever, whatever it is that's not working, I think, to find those, those people where you have common connections inside or outside. Um, to, to find that support. And if it's not right, I d yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not always easy. I think pioneering is not always easy. Mm -hmm. I think that's the part of the reality, unfortunately, also. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? We've got one down here. Oh, we've got a couple um, just over here, and then we've just got one down here too in the front. Hi, um, my name's Vanita. I work at Auckland Council, and um, it's really great that the council has come together with the... Um, Women's Network to put this event on. Um, one, uh, my question probably is related to working at council, and I really hope this isn't too career limitating. <laughs> There's probably some senior people here. But um, I know a couple of you work um, in TSI, and that's part of council. But I also know you guys are in a pretty unique working situation um, under Gail. I had a very close friend, um, Fiona Cunningham, who also worked with you guys, and she explained to me how it worked there and how you guys could make change and um, you kind of operated in your own sphere. Now, the council, though, is a very hierarchical organisation, and, and I've worked in mostly councils throughout my career. I'm sort of not the young person, I'm kind of more middle to at the other end. And um, I often found when you're not in management and you're working in a hierarchical organisation that um, people don't want to hear what you have to say. And it's only actually lately that I've ever really thought about, well, has that got anything to do with being female? And recently, people are talking about it's not women having a voice because we have a voice. It's because we're not heard and people don't want to listen. And what really made me angry, and that's kind of why I'm standing up here today, is I read something that was in the paper. It was an article that was to do with um, Auckland and infrastructure and the change going on. And there was a particular article written about the southern area and how the government's taking um, quite a role and in influential stand in it because they could see the need for coordinating what central government had to do. And two years ago, I, I wrote an email to the same person who was now appointed by the minister, Phil Twyford, to point out the issues that this article so aptly described, and two years ago nothing came of it, but it wasn't so much the disappointment of the person who is now, they're calling the appointment, 
The disappointment for me was no one at council could see that, and they weren't prepared to listen. And in fact, um, the voices that we had from our area just were quashed on this really, really important project. And it's not that the project's over, but I guess the question to you is how, how do we make our voices heard? And I, I'm not interested really in, you know, we have to get into management. And I have nothing against, you know, the desire to enter into the power roles. But I guess for me, I'm at a point in my career where I don't want to go in that particular direction. But I've got a lot to offer and lots of people will have a lot to offer. And we've got the skills, we've got the talent, we've got the knowledge. But how do you get that across if you don't want to join into the leadership roles? So I'd be interested to hear from anyone in the panel who's comment on that. Okay, so I won't go too long. Um, I had a, I have, I've had a similar experience where I was trying to get a point across about something really important to me and I never got a response. And I spoke to my mentors about this and they told me, if they're not going to hear your voice, CC in the people who they will, they can't not respond to. So it might be, well, <laughs> for me it was a local komatua. CC in a local komatua or someone else so that there's other people included in the conversation. Because I think that way they're more inclined to respond. So that's, that was a little thing that I had been told to. Oh, I think that's a really big question, actually. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm, I don't mean to, to turn this back, but in a way I think that's a question for the organisation to grapple with, because if key voices aren't being heard, there's a problem. <laughs> um, if there are key people in the organisation um, with things to contribute of value, which of course there are, um, what a missed opportunity. So um, I think it's always a risk with very hierarchical organisations that the top voices get heard and the lower voices, for want of a better term, don't. Um, and I think it's one of the challenges of, of leaders, leaders in, in such organisations to, to find ways to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, so I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer. I think we are also living in a time where um, I think a lot of common sense ideas are just not being heard generally. Um, I think we're living in a world right now where um, expediency, <laughs> quick wins, you know, things like that are, are, tend to dominate. And there's an amazing writer that I um, read and study with called Margaret Wheatley. She's out of America. Um, and she talks about islands of sanity. And she sort of talks about the fact that all around the world there are these little groups of people and Southern Initiative would absolutely be one of those. Um, who are trying to kind of keep common sense and practical, sensible ideas alive. And it's not about having to be the top of the organisation, but it is about how do you find a collective... You, I think there's got to be a community. A, I think community is key, actually, in this. <laughs> I think it's very hard on your own to be heard sometimes. A lone voice can be very hard. So I'm sorry, it's not a really... I can't think of an actual helpful answer other than... I think it's a challenge sometimes. I think a lot of people are struggling to be heard at the moment. So maybe this is something as women we need to be paying attention to is what are the forums like this? What are other forums um, to ensure that the right voices are being heard, actually? Mm. Um, and there's another, I think it's Peter Block talks about the fact that we look for leadership and leaders in all the wrong places. A leader isn't necessarily a manager. <laughs> And um, so how do we culturally create organisations? And it was my, the thing I said right at the beginning is, how do we learn to listen to one another better? Because that's actually what this is about, is paying attention and listening to each other, I think. Not easy, but really important. Um, or you do what Minnie did and you leave and you <laughs> start your own organisation. That's right. <laughs> uh, we had a question just down here. Uh, and... Yeah, I think this will be our last question. Hello. Kia ora, everyone. Um, I hope I'm saying that right just because um, I'm Kumi, 
And I realized at the beginning of this whole panel that I probably should not be here just because I'm actually just a tourist who is in Auckland for two days. <laughs> and, you know, I was just lucky enough to be here at the right time. And, you know, I'm thankful for the panelists and this whole discussion because I can bring back, I'm, I'm from Japan. I can bring back what I learned here, back to where I'm from, just because the whole political climate um, regarding women is very different. But um, my question for the panelists would be, um, in this moment, what do you think does it mean to being a woman? Since we're, you know, it's International Women's Day and we're celebrating women, what does it mean to be a woman at this moment? That would be my question. We'd just like to say welcome, Kumi. Konnichiwa. <laughs> um, kia ora sis, you're welcome, our doors are open. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think when I think about being a woman, I just, I also think about my nans, my grandmother, I think about being a mother, I think about being an auntie, I think about being a cousin, a daughter, and um, at the moment when I, like I said, I struggle with this because I don't, I don't, I don't, I necessarily don't see myself in that position of just being a woman. Like, there's more to me than just being a woman. My name is Ataro, and that is, you know, I am Māori, I am Cook Island, and those other facets come into play more than it does to be a woman. But when I think about it, I'm just like, being amazing. Like, you know, just being amazing. Like, and just knowing that whatever room we walk ourselves into, it's just going to be amazing. But, um, yeah, and I think I've, I've grown up alongside um, a lot of my, like, like Ayla, her story, grew up tomboy as, you know, went to a school where it was mainly just, you got to get rough and you got to be tough and you got to survive. And, and we often cha channeled ourselves into just wearing shorts and so we weren't like, you know, and um, getting recognised by anyone or like, I think it's really as being a woman is embracing who you are and every part of who you are, the flaws and all. And I think a lot of us as women, we're so fixated on the look as opposed to what we have and what we can bring to the table. So um, yeah, I think bringing a wealth of knowledge and, and experience and also just bringing those attributes as being a mother, an auntie, a cousin, uh, also to come in, they also come into play when you're conducting yourself in a space. So um, yeah, that's my piece of advice to you. So I hope, you can, I hope that you found that helpful, Gil. <laughs> yep, yeah, okay. Um, oh, I feel the same. I feel like as a woman today, what a time to be alive. Like, finally, from the backs of our grandparents and their older generations, we, ha we have a chance to share our stories and our strengths can't be denied anymore. In the workplace or in your personal life, strengths of being resilient and being empathetic, being a nurturer, those strengths are so um, necessary now, required. So I think, if anything, today is a time to like stand up and be, be proud as a woman and to share who you are and add your strengths and be brave and bold because I don't think women could do that. Um, in my Nana's generation, they were shushed, but we are not. It's undenied now, so that's how I feel about being a woman. Mana <laughs> wahine. It's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? It's such a hard question. I find that really hard as well. Um, you know, I guess it's quite fundamental, but uh, echoing again what's, what's been said here, and I think really recognising all the struggles of all the women who've gone before. I mean, it's just extraordinary what I think of the sacrifices that have been made, and um, to, to, well, I think for myself to be sitting here today are just are enormous. Um, and I think there is something, though, about... Uh, and again, I'm really hesitant about locking people into moulds of male, female, so I've, I think that's why I'm finding this a little tricky. tricky. What I think I would say, though, is uh, we live in this world of incredible complexity and, you know, that whole VUCA concept of, was it volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous? This very complex, fast-changing world. And I think about the, the sort of leadership and the energy that's required, uh, the people who can connect and interconnect, who can maintain and grow community, that, that listening, you know, intuitive listening, paying attention to what our environment needs and what we need collectively to be well, the concept of, of host, 
um, of being of service, of these sort of concepts um, are, are so important. And whether you're male or female, I, or what, however we identify, um, I think those are the qualities that the world actually desperately needs. So um, I think that's, that's probably what I'd, I'd reflect yeah. on, yeah. Just to add to that too, I was just gonna say, wahine are activators of change. Yeah. So that is the main thing that we want to say is that, you know, we've got the ability to be innovative and think outside of the square of these male-centric systems that we've been um, working inside of. And, um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that before I left. <laughs> and I want to add one more thing. Our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, is female. Um, our leader, Elder Ihumato Panya Newton, another female. So today is a time that we are being led by a strong wahine, and I feel like... We need to embrace that and stand up and acknowledge those things and let that be our motivation. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for the questions that you've been able to ask today. Just before I hand the time over to Deb, I just want to close this section off. Uh, last year, International Women's Day, uh, Ayla has just kindly reminded us about Jacinda Ardern and she uh, talked about two very specific things and one was to find role models in your life and uh, to make sure that uh, there are inspiring women who are inspiring you. And the second thing she talked about was wedging your foot in the door and making sure that you kept that door open for other women to walk through. I say smash the door down and make sure the door never goes up again. Uh, so today you've heard uh, there are some very specific um, things that our uh, panel have shared with us today that you can go away with for the rest of the year and uh, be able to uh, make sure that you're an activator of change in your workplace, in your home, in your community. And so we're really grateful to uh, have our, our guest speakers here today. So one more round of applause for, uh, to them.